introduce you. Uh, we have Dr. Peter Schmidt here. He's um, from Sandia National Labs. Uh, he got his uh, PhD in physics from the University of Colorado at Boulder in 2003 and um, did a postdoc uh, there as well. In this, um, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, the standards place. <laughs> yeah, that's one the standards and technology. Um, and came down to Sandia after that uh, and started at Sandia in 2006. And he uh, was promoted to principal member of technical staff uh, two years ago. And um, he has over 20 peer reviewed publications as well as three patents, including one for the atomic magnetometer. And he's going to talk to us today about alternative uh, technology for collecting MEG data. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to come over here. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk to you today about our efforts towards building a multi-channel atomic magnetometer array. We're doing magnetoencephalography. Um, one note is, so I'm calling these atomic magnetometers in the literature you come across other terms for these devices, such as optically pumped magnetometers because they use a laser to pump the atoms in the atomic magnetometer, not water. Optically pumped magnetometer. So for the talk, I'll be using the atomic magnetometer. Um, so as an outline, I'll try and introduce what we're trying to do uh, and go through our uh, first sensor design, talk about the performance of it, and talk about the MEG measurements we've done. The measurements were actually done here in the shielded room uh, next to the squid machine over there. And uh, we were able to do measurements with both one and two sensors. And then right now we're in the middle of a project that's working towards scaling up to a larger array, we're actually looking at a 36 channel array. Also done some redesign of the sensor. And then also, uh, talk about some system considerations we're starting to think about. And we've done some simulations uh, thinking about how we'll use the atomic magnetometer array to detect and localize signals in the brain. All right, so to motivate this, um, give you a little bit of history of the atomic magnetometers and then why we think that are good for biomagnetic applications. And uh, so in the early 2000s, uh, it was really the first time that really high sensitivity mag atomic magnetometers were demonstrated. And so in a group in Princeton of Micromolis, uh, they showed a sensitivity of uh, 0.5 femtotesla per hertz in a magnetometer. And this is some, the device looks something like this. It's kind of a really, about a true representation of what it looked like. If you have a potassium vapor cell, and so it's a glass cell that contains the atomic vapor. And so that's kind of the, the sensitive volume of the magnetometer. And then it goes through some polarization optics, and then you see a detector array over here. And, uh, and so with this device, you know, we've got this great sensitivity, and that compares very favorably to squid sensors, which operate between one and three times the Tesla per meters. Um, and then also in the early 2000s, uh, very small magnetometers were developed. So this is a device that's about three millimeters high, and that's a complete magnetometer device that can uh, have quite good sensitivity. And so this was down to about 70 temper tests millimeters. And so the combination of these two developments got people thinking about, all right, what can we use these for? We have very high sensitivity devices, we can have very small devices, and maybe it could work can get it both small and high sensitivity. And, uh, and so there are various groups around the country and around the world that are working uh, towards these goals of making small high sensitivity magnetometers. And so, so then, you know, what have people started to do? And there's been a lot of work in, in biomagnetic applications. And so there's uh, been a lot of measurements of magnetocardiography, measurements of magnetoencephalography, and then also measurements using these magnetometers for measuring uh, magnetic nanoparticles in biological systems. 
Uh, and then also there's another application that's been in geomagnetism and uh, a group of micromoles built something called the rock magnetometer to measure the paleomagnetism of rocks, which is, it turns out to be important for some uh, geologic research. Uh, oh, yeah, so here's a picture of one of the uh, magnetocardiography uh, systems that was developed over in Europe by Anton Weiss. Okay, so I think you all are very familiar with the current technology for squid systems. And uh, as far as I can tell, these systems work very well and uh, have the high sensitivity to the three femtotesla per hertz, high bandwidth, have whole head coverage. And so, but if you're looking at a new technology, you want to find things that are where your technology might win out. And so we're trying to look at the disadvantages. And uh, one of the big ones that we see is, and I think you guys feel the pain, is uh, the cooling and how expensive liquid helium is. And, uh, and I guess last year there was a lot of people on about keeping the liquid helium reserve open in Texas and things like that. So, you know, it's expensive. Sources, I guess, can be unreliable. I've been told that some systems have gone up to temperature because they haven't been able to get the helium they required. Um, the other thing is that these systems are quite large, so they require a big large scale of shielded room, magnetically shielded room. And so we think with a smaller device size, you can potentially go to a smaller shield size, which saves some money that way. And also the helmet size is fixed, uh, because you have this fixed door wall. And so with our atomic magnetometer technology, we hope that we can figure out how to make an array that could accommodate varying head sizes. So you go from a small child or a baby up to a large, largest adult. Okay. Um, so I guess I kind of already went through this list, but of how atomic magnetometers can improve things. And uh, so we don't need any cryogenic cooling. In fact, we have the opposite problem. The atomic vapor cell needs to be heated to about 150 degrees Celsius. So we need to protect the subject from a, a hot vapor cell rather than a very cold uh, squid pickup coil. Uh, and we think we can make the devices much smaller. This is probably kind of extreme and we're not going to quite achieve that, that small size. But uh, still quite small. So we can potentially work on something like a transportable system. Um, and then again, there's the possibility of the reconfigurable array. And uh, so you can try to accommodate varying head sizes and also potentially reconfigure for other applications like uh, MCG. Of course, in developing a new te technology, there's going to be drawbacks that you have to consider when you're working on that. And so in the atomic magnetometer, there's a real trade-off between bandwidth and, sen and sensitivity. And, um, and so we're, we're not going to be able to achieve the same sensitivity this with, with getting the full bandwidth one might want for this uh, for the application. But we're thinking we're, we'll get around 500 decibel brew hertz and a bandwidth uh, greater than 100 hertz. We have the opposite of thermal problem, as I already mentioned. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting about this is that the sensor position and sensitive axis is not fixed. And so if you really want to get into start to do source localization, you have to know where exactly your sensor is and what field component it's measuring. And uh, so that's, that's a problem we're starting to work on now, and trying to figure out how, how we can do that as we build up the array. Know the, the sensor position and the field component that each sensor is measuring. Uh, and also, there's some issues with the sensor gain varying from sensor to sensor, and it also can drift around. And so as we build up a sense system, we might have a lot, have, have a lot of uh, calibration routines built into it as we, as we go along and measuring over time. Uh, so worldwide, there's several groups working on uh, atomic magnetometers for MEG. So I just wanted to discuss those briefly. So this was the first one that was done. This was at Princeton. And uh, so they developed the system. Uh, and you can see the person-sized shield they developed. So this is a shield that costs, I think they told me it cost around $40,000 fit a person inside of it. So that's a significant savings in terms of that magnetic shield. 
plus as you make the shield smaller, the shielding factor gets better. So there's a definite advantage there. Uh, so you can see below this person's head, there's a, uh, uh, this is where the activity is happening. Uh, and, and then this technology has moved on to a company called Twinly. And they're starting to look, looking at building larger arrays and how you might scale it up and actually sell it. Another company that's working on MEG is another small company called QSpin. And so this is their magnetometer. And then my former group at the National Institutes of uh, Standards and Technology has probably built the smallest magnetometer that people are using for MEG. So this is about a, a centimeter on the side. And then this is our device here. And so this is a little bit bigger than the say this device and this device, but what we're trying to do with this single larger device is have four individual channels so we can have a single module that measures the field at four spatially separated points inside the sensor. Okay, so some of the goals of what we're trying to do in our project. Um, so when we decided to go after a four channel sensor, we were really motivated by the Electa or the Electa Neuromag uh, triple sensor chip, which has one magnetometer and two planar gradiometers. And so we were thinking, all right, let's try and get uh, uh, a device that has some, somewhat similar functionality and also has a somewhat similar uh, size space between the uh, different magnetometer channels. So I think it says 28 millimeters here, the size of the chip. Um, we want to look at getting adequate sensitivity and bandwidth. We want something less than 10 femtotesla root hertz and 100 hertz bandwidth. Um, we'd like to have a fairly small footprint. Our original goal was about 30 millimeters on the side. We're, I think that we're looking more at like 40 millimeters on the side right now. And one thing that we wanted to get away from was um, this device here was using free space beams, so that was the first device. It didn't seem very flexible for it to us. It didn't seem like it'd be easy to achieve full head coverage when you have large laser beams passing by someone's head that are contained in these black, black covers here. And so we wanted a, a device that could pick up and move around and, and put, put exactly where you want it. And so we want to use fiber optic coupled sensors. And then also the potential for radiometric output. So with our four channels, we can create gradients and uh, gradient measurements uh, in two different directions. So we've been working for a long time with Mike Wisent, who used to be here, now at uh, Wright State University. And so in this current project that I'll discuss later on, we're working with Wright State, Mike Wisent at Wright State, uh, also a fellow at Can Do Systems, John Mosher at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, we also are collaborating with uh, Bruce Fish at the UNM School of Medicine, and then we also want to continue to work here with MRN. Uh, we're planning comparative studies between our device and uh, the squid system you have here. Okay, so you know, in this collaboration, we want to be able to get design input from neuroscientists, to, so we're designing something that's actually useful and also strengthen ties to the ultimate user. So some of the engineering challenges we're facing in, in developing this system is, uh, maybe this is a short list, I'm sure there's more things, but uh, the, one of the first things you gotta think about doing MEG is how you get rid of noise, magnetic noise from the environment. And uh, so the Earth's field is about 10 to minus four Tesla, and the field from the brain is about 10 to minus 13 Tesla, so that's nine orders of magnitude uh, that you've got to do effective shielding against. And um, so in our first measurements, we use a shielded room here. This is the older slide, it still says the line is two. And, um, um, and then in our current project, we're gonna be uh, building our own shielded chamber. And so for our first measurements, we came over here and characterized the room see how good or bad it was. And, um, and also, it turned out we needed some, some active shielding to get our sensors to work inside that uh, shielding room. And uh, 
and also turned out to be very useful to use some gradient measurements to remove noise inside the machine. Um, one of the other things we really need to work on is that you know, our, our device is operating somewhere between 150C to 203C. And so we need good insulation between the, our, the active volume of the cell, which is the atomic vapor cell, and the subject's head. And so we want to do this while maintaining a, a compact design and minimizing the distance between the sensor head and the, and the subject. And so we're looking at different ways of uh, use of, say, vacuum gap or microporous <coughs> insulations to, uh, uh, to minimize that distance while still maintaining a safe outside temperature of the sensor. You can also consider using active cooling and, or, or air. And so looking at either water, water cooling or air cooling. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to use fiber optics to bring in light in and out of the sensor. And, uh, and so we're looking at some modulation techniques that uh, allow us to use the fiber optics and things like that. And then also in developing the magnetic sensor, we have, they can't allow any magnetic materials inside the sensor. And so that's always an engineering challenge when you can't use any, say, metal components, or you've got to minimize the metal components. All right, so bear with me while I try and describe some of the physics of our sensor. Um, and so our technique, we dubbed it the two-color pump probe scheme. And so it's a little bit different from what other people in the field of atomic magnetometry have done. And so our, our idea is really based around the, this idea produced out of the Micromollus group at Princeton. And, uh, and so they were used, able to use electrically polarized light uh, to produce a sensor that had a 7 femtotesla per meters and 150 hertz band. So that sounded pretty good to us. And we were looking at that design and thought, well, maybe there's some ways we could make it better by uh, using two colors rather than just a single single pump probe beam. You know, you're going to use individual pump and probe beams. And it turns out the atom that we're using is rubidium 87, and there's uh, there's two resonant transitions inside the atom, one at 795 nanometers and one at 780 nanometers. And so our strategy was to then, okay, so we have these two transitions. Let's see if we can use one of these transitions to do the pumping, one of the sort of probing. We can optimize these two functions uh, separately and hopefully make a bet better magnetometer. And, and so the, the basic physics of the magnetometer, kind of uh, rough terms, is that this black line indicates the blast cell that contains a vapor of rubidium atoms. And each one of these arrows indicates the electron spin associated with, with each atom. And what we want to do is set up a situation where all these spins are aligned in the cell so you get a macroscopic magnetization inside the cell. The way we do that is through a process called optical pumping. And what we have is circularly polarized light um, that comes in and that uh, spin angular momentum from the light gets transferred from the light to the atoms. And so by shining a laser beam, we essentially get all the spins inside the atomic vapor aligned along a particular direction. So that gives us uh, this macroscopic polarization. And then what we want to do to measure what's going on in the cell is we want to measure the direction or the orientation of this, of this polarization of the, or the orientation of the atoms inside the cell. The way we do that is we send in a linearly polarized probe beam, so that's the darker red color here. And what we want to do is look at something called the Faraday effect. Look at how the polarization rotates as it goes through the, the vapor cell. And so the amount of uh, polarization rotation we measure has something to do with the orientation, the direction of the polarization of the atoms inside the cell. And so we do that uh, with the 780 nanometer light. We do the pumping with the 795 light. We do the probing with the 780 nanometer light. Um, so these are some details about how we can achieve this all with this, the, the beams in the same direction. We have a wave plate that allows us at 780 to send a linear polarized light, and at 795 nanometers, we get circular polarized light. Then at the output, we use an interference filter to block the pump beam and just look at the probe beam. We send that to an analyzer that measures the polarization angle of the light. 
Okay, so then if you want to measure a magnetic field, what goes on? And so inside the vapor cell, you have all these spins aligned along a particular direction. Now, here I'm indicating a magnetic field that you want to sense that's out, out of the plane of the board. And so, so with that, uh, if you have a, an applied field, the spins will start to process around the field. So you get out your right hand and you say, okay, we gotta, you know, we'll rotate that way. And, uh, and so when that happens, the amount of uh, polarization rotation will change. And so as the field is applied and, and the, uh, uh, the spins rotate away from the pump direction, we'll, we'll measure that on, on, our, uh, on the 780 nanometer light that's going to the analyzer. We measure that change in uh, optical polarization rotation. And so that's essentially the signal we're looking for. Now then to really make this as a magnetometer, one of the things we need to do is apply a modulated magnetic field and that def defines the sensitive axis of the, of the magnetometer. So we can apply a modulation say either in and out of the plane here or vertically. And depending on which direction we apply that modulation defines which, um, which component of the magnetic field we're going to measure. So this magnetometer can either can measure two components of the magnetic field depending on which direction we apply the modulation. Any direction perpendicular to the pump and probe laser, we can measure that component of the magnetic field. And so the fact that we can measure two different components of the, of the magnetic field uh, with the same device is something we'd like to take advantage of as we develop the system. Uh, so here's some of the relevant atomic spin processes. Maybe I don't want to go into this in too much detail. But uh, you can see there's the atomic spin indicated by P here. There's several processes that go, go on. And so just to kind of highlight the terms, uh, the atoms will diffuse through the vapor cell. The atoms will respond to a magnetic field. And this R here indicates that we're doing optical pumping with a probe beam. And then there's also a, a decoherence mechanism. That, uh, basically, the atoms through collisions the atoms basically lose their memory of what magnetic field they experience as they go through a collision and decohere. Uh, if you analyze this equation and look at how the polarization responds, in particular, we're looking at this component called PZ. And, uh, and so if we set uh, Bx and By equal to zero, sorry, I misspoke, Bx and Bz equal to zero, and look at how the field depends on B, By, we get this nice Lorentzian line shape. And, and so, so that's the signal we're looking for, is this kind of nice uh, sort of bell shape there. And uh, so that's the signal we derive, and we, then we apply the magnetic field modulation, we turn this uh, Lorentzian line shape to, into something linear, basically take the derivative of the, uh, of the Lorentzian to uh, give us a nice linear signal for measurement. So one of the key um, aspects of why magnetometers got a lot more sensitive in the, in the early 2000s was that uh, basically the group of micromollus figured out that you could go into this low, very low field magnetic field regime to get into something called the spin exchange relaxation free regime. Essentially what that did was it allowed the coherence time of the atoms to get a lot longer by going to low field. And, um, and, and so, if we look at the relevant collision cross sections, I think what you want to just notice is there's uh, basically three orders of magnitude between these numbers, as we're going to from the kind of the, the regime with spin exchange collisions causing decoherence, and going to a low field regime, and going and getting into something called the spin destruction regime. And so we're able to gain basically three orders of magnitude in sensitivity by going to that regime. And so then. We we're all, all of a sudden in, the, in a place where we can say, oh, we got a lot more magnetic field sensitivity. These devices are great. Let's go out and find a way to use them. OK, so looking at our, uh, the sensor design, uh, so here's a schematic of it. So we bring in all the light on a single optical fiber, send it into, into some polarization optics. It goes through a culminating lens. Then it passes into an oven, which contains our vapor cell. Uh, 
light passes through the vapor cell, hits a mirror, and comes back, and it goes back out to our detection objects. So you can see here, this curve is supposed to be, say, ahead if you're trying to do MEG. And then you have some high quality insulation to protect this, the subject. Um, and then as, uh, what we like about this design is we have this retroreflective design that allows the, uh, the vapor cell to get quite close to the, to the subject. And that's our key thing for MEG is to get uh, whatever is doing the magnetic field sensitivity, sensing as close as possible to the head because signals fall off very quickly as you move away from the head. Um, and so then we can say modulate in the vertical or the in and out of the plane of the board here to define the sensitive axis of the magnetometer. And then also, uh, we have quadrant detectors on the detection end. And so this is what gives us our four channels of the magnetometer. And so the quadrant detector, so we have two detectors here, which analyzes the polarization uh, of the probe beam. And so we divide that into quadrants. And, and so then as you, when you do that, essentially get four spatially separated regions inside the vapor cell over which you're measuring the magnetic field. And so, so this plot is showing kind of a Gaussian shaped beam that's going into the vapor cell. And then as you divide it up, you've got to figure out, okay, where's the center of measurement of each channel? And it turns out that the uh, spacing was, wasn't as much as we would have liked. Uh, so our initial calculation showed that it was spaced by about six millimeters. And then in practice, when we went and measured it, it was between four and five millimeters. And so it's really not enough uh, spacing to give uh, uh, really spatially uncorrelated information when you're trying to do MEG. So that's the problem we're trying to fix in our, our newest sensor design. All right, so uh, here's a picture of the device, kind of the inside of the device, so you can see the, the uh, optical fiber coming in, the lens is sitting here, here's the oven that contains the vapor cell, and so here's a photo of, of the vapor cell, so it's literally just a, a glass vapor cell that you would evacuate, and uh, then backfill it with some rubidium metal and put a little buffer gas inside it. And then over here we have some polarization optics and detectors. Uh, so this is all made out of T10 fiberglass, and uh, and one of the nice things about this, having an enclosed device is we're able to see much more one over F noise compared to uh, some of the tabletop devices people have built over the years. And so it seems to indicate that a lot of the one over F noise comes from uh, the air currents messing with uh, your laser beams, laser beams that pass by. Uh, and so here's the, uh, the performance of the device. Uh, so there's what I'm plotting here is the sensitivity in femtotesla per hertz versus the measurement frequency in hertz. And so looking at a single channel of the magnetometer, that's the blue trace here. And so that's operating around 15 femtotesla per hertz. What that really, that sensitivity noise floor really is though, is the magnetic noise inside of our magnetic shield and not the true sensitivity of the device. So that's something we always run into when we're building these very sensitive devices that the environment that you make is often noisier. Uh, it has a noise floor that's above the noise floor of your sensor. And so that's a big motivation going for multi-channel devices is it allows you, allows you to make uh, gradient measurements. So if we make a gradient measurement, uh, that's the green and the, and the red lines there, it shows that the sensitivity of each channel is actually a lot better than this individual sensitivity that we measure with just a single device. And so here we think we're getting down to the actual noise floor of the, of the magnetometer. And so around 10 hertz, we're seeing a sensitivity uh, below 5 hundred tesla per hertz. Okay, so this was, um, now we I'll go back and mention the fact that the reason that the uh, noise is increasing at, uh, at higher frequencies due to the bandwidth of the device. And so up around 100 hertz, we're really seeing a fall off of the, of the sensitivity uh, <clears throat> due to uh, reduced response or reduced gain 
the signals at uh, at the higher frequencies. So here, here you can start to see how we might be trading off sensitivity for uh, for bandwidth. Okay, so we um, made a system that we installed here, the magnetic shield roof, so you can see the electric neural bank system there. And uh, we also have uh, some coils that we needed to put around our magnetic, <coughs> our atomic magnetometer. Uh, because, uh, as I recall, the, the residual field inside that shielded room is about 100 nanotesla. We need to operate at fields below 1 nanotesla to make our device work in this high sensitivity search regime. And so, so really, we weren't canceling any magnetic fields, we were just uh, uh, canceling canceling DC fields. Uh, and then, uh, so with uh, both responses we were measuring, we did median nerve stimulation, and we also did auditory stimulation. And so here's a picture showing the magnetometer inside its vacuum enclosure uh, up against my head. And uh, you can see the uh, Optical fiber coming in, and some of the photodiode heater wires are coming out. And so the the business end of the vice, where the atomic vapor cell is, is as close to the end as we can get. And then outside, to run that sensor, uh, we have a laser cart that generates all the required laser beams uh, that uh, make the magnetometer work. And then we also have a data acquisition system to bring in the four channels of data. And then we have uh, the guy who's collecting the data. This is Court Johnson, who did a lot of the work with me on this first sensor. Okay, so it uh, turns out that noise in the shield of the room is uh, quite a bit more than the sensitivity of our device. Uh, so, you know, our, our sensitivity is around here, around 500 tesla per hertz. And then the noise in the room is peaked up. And 40 hertz around 100 tesla per hertz. This is uh, kind of unfortunate for us to see because this is right around the band frequency band where you want to measure your signals and, uh, for both uh, median nerve and auditory stimulation. And, uh, and so it turned out when we went off to do uh, two sensor devices, we were able to do some good gradient measurements to suppress that noise. Nevertheless, with this noise in the room, we were able to do some reasonable measurements. And so this is the uh, median nerve stimulation. And so on the left-hand side here, we have the atomic magnetometer signals. And on the right, we have the uh, same subject um, as measured by the electro-neuromagnetic system. And I'm not sure exactly what to say about this, you know, other than both systems see signals right now. They're not really the same same signals in terms of morphology, and so I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, about why that's different. Um, we also did the auditory stimulation, and uh, here there was a little bit better uh, correspondence between the two, between the two systems. And, um, so we both essentially see a peak here around 80 milliseconds. And, uh, so in the auditory, we had these were uh, this is data from that thousand hertz tone in both years. And, uh, so for this, we uh, averaged 320 stimuli, and we left to 110 stimuli. So one of the primary reasons why we think we don't see the same signals from both the atomic magnetometers and the squid system that we're measuring different components of the magnetic field. So the squid system measures the so-called radial component, the field component that sticks away from the head, sticks out away from the head. Whereas we're measuring field components that are um, transverse to the, to the skull, the scalp. And, and so because of that, we shouldn't expect to see exactly the same signals. Um, another difference that you can see is that there's a lot higher correlation between what we see in the atomic magnetometer compared to four squid magnetometers that are that are separated but localized roughly in the same region. And 
primary reason for that is the magnetometer channels are only separated by about five millimeters. There's going to be a very high degree of correlation if you have that small spatial separation. Uh, whereas the squid channels are separated more by like something like 30 millimeters. And so because you have that larger spatial separation, we expect to see greater variation between the adjacent channels. Uh, and then there's also a difference in bandwidth. Uh, the atomic magnetometer is about, about a 20 hertz bandwidth. The squid magnetometer is something like a kilohertz bandwidth. But, um, I can't exactly remember what the uh, what the filtering was put in place for these systems, but it's something around uh, I think it was below 40 hertz. So we had a bandpass or yeah, bandpass filtering between about five and four hertz. Okay, so after we did those single channel measurements or single magnetometer measurements, um, we went ahead and built two of the magnetometers. And we're really looking at auditory stimulation, so you can see the uh, uh, the tubes that bring the sound into the ears there. And so we have two atomic magnetometers on either side. Another thing we added that becomes more apparent here is uh, these coils were wrapped directly on the magnetometers. So we could apply the modulation in different directions and, and, and uh, optimize the field strengths for both for both sensors with the local coils. So basically, the one and the two indicate which component of the field we're going to be measuring. And I guess the other thing to point out is you know, in the next couple of slides, I'll be measuring, pointing out field components called the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. And so those are indicated by these directions here. So horizontal refers to horizontal relative to the floor. And so one of the nice things we're able to do with this two sensor system was essentially do something like radiometry. Um, although we tried to be a little more sophisticated about it, but in the end, I think it was basically radiometry. And, and so that allows us to do some noise cancellation of the magnetic noise that's inside the sheet. So again, we're doing a, a kilohertz auditory stimulation applied to both ears simultaneously. Uh, and so we're recording from both the left and the right sensors. What we're showing here is the vertical component Oh, here's telling us what the filtering is. It's between 2 and 55 hertz, averaged over 330 uh, trials. <coughs> um, so, so this is uh, kind of the raw average signal that we get out of the sensors. And so the sensor of the left ear seems to show a peak for the auditory stimulus, whereas the sensor of the right ear doesn't, doesn't really seem to show anything. However, we're we went ahead and used uh, uh, kind of a version of a uh, signal processing technique called signal space projection uh, to do some noise cancellation. And so when we when you do that process, I mean, it's probably not so different from also a principal component analysis. When we do that process, uh, we're able to really cut down on the noise and uh, well, essentially what turns out to be basically a gradient measurement. And uh, measuring the field difference the sensors on the left and right side of the head. And so we're able to see clear M100 peaks um, from both the left and right side of the head, whereas before it was kind of buried in the bones. So it's nice to see that we can calibrate things well enough to start to do this sort of signal process. Um, and then going on looking at, so here's the vertical component, and so we see peaks left side going one direction, left right side going opposite direction. And then the horizontal field, uh, it's hard to discern, discern any clear peak. And if you think about how the dipole is oriented inside the auditory cortex, it seems to make sense. Uh, we also had the opportunity to do uh, multiple subjects. And so multiple meaning only three, I guess. And uh, I guess the nice conclusion to draw away from that is Point across three subjects, but you can see um, auditory response from all three subjects. It was gratifying to see one subject didn't have a signal like this. Okay, so now I want to move on to what we're working on right now. And um, so we're 
our previous project was an uh, internally funded San Diego project. Now we're in the middle of a project funded by NIH to build a 36 channel atomic magnetometer array with the goal to start doing source localization inside the brain. And um, so, uh, so we're looking at building a 36 channel array. So what you see here is a three by three array of four channel sensors. Uh, we also want to put this inside of a human sized shield, hopefully proving that this uh, shield is small can work, leading towards uh, smaller and cheaper installations. And uh, then we want to do comparative studies between the atomic magnetometer and the squid system here at MRN. And so this is a Again, in collaboration with MRN, UN Hospital, Candy Systems, and also at Wright State University, where my boys are going to. Uh, so, some of the major projects, one of the first things we wanted to do was redesign the sensor, make it a little bit smaller, get it down to this 4x4 four four centimeter footprint on the head, get a sensitivity less than 10 femtotesimal per root hertz, which we achieved previously, but the bandwidth was only about 20 hertz. Here, we want to get the bandwidth over 100 hertz. Measure of broad frequency band. Uh, we need to carefully model the human size shield to make sure that it's going to work. One of the things we're concerned about is if we go to a smaller system, we're going to have larger magnetic field gradients. And so we want to make sure that we can handle that. Uh, another concern when you're going up to an array, uh, particularly to our magnetometer design, is that it requires a modulated field to make it to define the sensitive axis. And so there's kind of two approaches to that, just apply external coils and apply a modulated field. And uh, then if you start thinking about how, well, how am I going to stack sensors up around the head, then the geometry doesn't work very well. And so what we really want to do is have local coils on each uh, magnetometer, and which define, defines a local local sensitive axis. That way we can have a lot of flexibility with how we array the sensors around the head. So that's, this is a problem that is turning out to be kind of hard to address and we're kind of in the midst of that right now. Uh, we also need to work on adapting source localization codes for the atomic magnetometer geometry. And so we've been looking at both brainstorm and field trip and been doing some work with uh, John Mosher Cleveland Clinic on with Brainstorm to see how we can adapt existing software that was developed for squids and use it for atomic magnetometers. And that actually looks pretty promising to this point. Uh, we need to work towards constructing the array. And, uh, and then after we get the array constructed, we want to first characterize the system with an MEG phantom. And uh, so we're working in that direction now. One of the things we've got to be very, very careful about is knowing the exact position and field component that's measured by each sensor. There's going to be a lot of calibration involved in that. So that's a problem we're going to be facing down the road here. I think we'll take a considerable amount of work. And in the end, then, we're going to be doing auditory and somatosensory recordings on human subjects, and then again, doing this comparative study between the atomic and the and space systems. Uh, and so one of the challenges we're going to face there is kind of the co-registration between the two systems to make sure that we're measuring uh, the fields in the same spot. OK, so this is our sensor redesign. And uh, one of the critical things we wanted to address was the fact that the previous magnetometer had a uh, separation between the individual sensors within the sensor in the sensor head of only about five millimeters. We wanted it to increase that to uh, uh, more than a centimeter, looking between 14 and 18 millimeters. Actually, I need to change the number on this slide. We ended up with a design that has about an 18 millimeter separation between the, uh, um, between the channels within the sensor. The way we do that is instead of applying one large beam through the vapor cell, what we're going to do is apply uh, four smaller beams in the vapor cell. That'll very well define where the sen sensitive volume of each channel is, so we can have a really good knowledge about the exact location of each channel, which is very important for the spatial localization algorithms. 
And uh, also, the previous magnetometer uh, vapor cell was about a centimeter long. We're shrinking that down to four millimeters. Again, giving us a better knowledge about where each uh, sensor channel is measuring the magnetic field. Then we also wanted to work on minimizing the distance from the vapor cell to the head. The other uh, system had about a, I think it was a 25 millimeter separation uh, from the outside of the sensor to the vapor cell. Here we're trying to get that below uh, 10 millimeters. Uh, so to achieve this kind of four channel or four beam design, uh, the magnetometer looks largely the same, except that we've added basically a diffractive optical element or a 2D gradient, gradient which takes one beam and divides it up into four beams. So it's a pretty simple thing to add. Um, and so we're, we're in the midst right now of constructing this magnetometer. Haven't quite got a functioning prototype yet. But by adding this, we're able to get the four beams and get the larger spacious operation that's, that we think will be important as we go forward. Um, so the thing that we have been able to do is take a vapor cell, put it in a laboratory setup, and then measure the performance. As we go with the smaller beam size, the smaller vapor cell dimensions, and we're able to see good sensitivity again. And so here we're operating around 10 femtotesla per hertz, pretty similar to the 7 femtotesla per hertz sensitivity we had before. And the big improvement is that we're able to see the sensitivity from about 5 hertz over to 100 hertz. So we've been able to drastically increase the bandwidth. And so for this measurement here, the bandwidth is 133 hertz. Here's another bandwidth measurement we did is showing 110 hertz for the band. So we have, we've been able to achieve the bandwidth over 100 hertz. And so this is the normalized frequency response as a function of measurement frequency. And uh, so you can see a nice flat response here, and then it rolls off in frequencies above 100 hertz. So I think we're well on our way to getting a good functioning prototype. And that's where all our efforts right now are basically focused. Uh, one of the other things we've done uh, in trying to figure out if, you know, if this atomic magnetometer business is worth anything is we wanted to do some simula simulations that show uh, <coughs> that, you know, on a, pre a previous slide, I showed that the squid sensor is measuring the radial component and our atomic magnetometer is going to be measuring the uh, transverse components in the field. And so we wanted to do simulations that show that we basically get the same information by measuring uh, those different magnetic field components. Uh, so we've, um, for this particular simulations, we we're using field trip. And, uh, and so essentially we uh, define some sources, define uh, a sensor array, and uh, performed forward and the forward solution, the inverse solution calculations for different source strengths, positions, and sensor array geometries. And um, basically things worked out pretty well. Um, so this is kind of giving you a sense of, of the, uh, the array. And so this is a, a six by six array of sensors. It's kind of looking end on here, and then uh, this is a top-down view. And also, we're showing that you know the, the atomic magnetometers can measure two components of the magnetic field. Actually, we can do that both sequentially and or simultaneously. And, uh, and, and so we want to show that, OK, say if we measure just the vertical component, we measure just the horizontal component, how does that compare, to, say, to measuring just the radial component? Or, or if we measure both components simultaneously. <laughs> so this figure shows uh, channel spacings within each sensor is 20 millimeters and uh, module separation of 45 millimeters. Uh, the sensor we're actually building is uh, something more like 18 millimeter channel separation within each sensor. Uh, so we're showing a little bit more about the simulations. Uh, here we have uh, various number of sources. We're just basically modeling current dipoles here. And uh, so we have depths of uh, 15, 25, 35, 45 millimeters from the surface of a, a sphere of a brain. 
And, uh, and then we have several different locations for the atomic magnetometers at very uh, distances away from the, the surface of the ring, or of the scalp, rather. Um, and so that's going to be uh, those numbers there. <laughs> Okay, and so one of the first things we want to understand, I think people are fairly used to uh, looking at field maps produced by the, uh, the squid system. And, and so we wanted to basically compare what these field maps would look like. Um, so if you take the axial squid magnetometer and you have a, a current dipole oriented, say, uh, in this direction below, the, uh, below your, your sensor array, you know, then the field's making some, uh, you know, it's kind of coming out of the head and diving back down into the head. And so that's what this, this is basically showing, is that, uh, you know, you have a positive field over here, negative field over here as you move over the, uh, the source. Um, and if you look at the horizontal and, and vertical components uh, measured by the, the uh, atomic magnetometers, they actually compare very well to the planar gradiometers that are used in the, in the squid system. So if you look at the field maps, look at the horizontal field component that compares pretty well to the uh, planar gradiometer that's in the horizontal direction. And then also the, uh, if you look at the uh, vertical the atomic magnetometer component, that corresponds to the vertical uh, planar gradiometer in the squid system. So there's, a, I guess, a nice correspondence between the two systems, if you're look, used to looking at field maps. Uh, then we also wanted to, to look at the, uh, see how the signal strengths compared, and uh, on short of it, basically the signal strengths are equivalent. Maxwell's equation will give you that. And, uh, and so this is looking at different source depths here, so we're applying several different depths, and then here's are the different angles or different positions of the uh, sources inside the ring. So that's the angles refer to the different angular positions inside the inside the brain, and the depths refer to how, how deep it is inside the spherical brain the simulation. And, and so obviously as the deeper you are, the weaker the sources are, and as you get closer to the surface, the stronger the field strengths are. And, um, and so we're uh, comparing several different things here. Uh, we have, um, I guess the red line is the, oh, okay, so the 36H refers to the horizontal fuel component. And then, so then the green is actually the vertical fuel component. And then the blue is kind of uh, average sum of all of them. And then we also wanted to look at how this compared to a couple different squid configurations. So one would be a 36 channel axial squid magnetometer, so this would be something akin to the CTF magnetometer, the CTF squid system, which I guess you guys had previously. And then uh, the yellow is the is a 27 channel planar squid radiometer. And so that's basically taking the two planar squid radiometers and the magnetometer channel uh, from that uh, planar chip that Electin uses in, in their system. And basically, we're kind of getting the same signal strength out of them. Um, and then looking at the localization performance, what we did for this simulation is to uh, uh, basically just do dipole fitting. And uh, so we're not doing the more advanced like beam forming uh, analysis for the simulation. And so this is an average of 20 different source localizations and four different source orientations. And, uh, and this is at the smallest sensor cap. And we also set a, a noise floor for the system at 10 decibel per hertz. And here we're looking at the horizontal, the vertical, and using all 72 atomic and atomic channels simultaneously. And it basically makes sense as you apply more channels, you get a better, a better idea where your source is located. And so in the simulation, um, you know, under these ideal conditions, we're showing that with the atomic magnetometer system, we're able to do source localization on the, on the sub-millimeter level. Of course, as you go into 
a real system where you have uh, co-registration issues, environmental noise, this will start to get a lot, a lot worse. But for the purpose of this uh, simulation, we wanted to kind of see how well we could do uh, with the AMs and compare that to the squid system. And so that's uh, showing this plot, the comparison between the atomic magnetometers and the squid systems. And so again, over here we have a dipole fit error, error as a function of uh, simulation trials. And so again, we're changing the depth and also changing the, the angular position of each, uh, of each source in, inside of our spherical brain. And so there's a lot of lines on here. Basically, they're all kind of lining up with each other. So that's atomic magnetometers in the two directions, and also the two uh, different squid systems we're on. And so the, the lowest two lines here are the, uh, so the green is the 72 channel array of, of magnetometers. And then the blue is the, uh, the axial radiometer, uh, basically the CTF style, style squid system. And so basically, with, with those two styles of systems, we get this we get the same mobilization performance. And so that was the important thing for us to show is that whether you could, whether you're measuring the radial component or the transverse, transverse field components, you get basically the same results. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the talk here. And um, so, um, so here's a picture of the first device we built. And so, We've been able to develop a magnetometer that's uh, compact, single axis sensor design, sensitivity is around 500 tesla fluid hertz. And we're able to successfully measure squid MEG, or sorry, successfully measure MEG signals with our atomic magnetometer. And measuring the uh, transverse field components uh, with multiple sensors. And so right now we're in the midst of our NIH project to build an atomic magnetometer array. And I'd say it's looking pretty, pretty promising towards uh, being successful in doing that. Um, so we're in the midst of uh, building up our new sensor, and, uh, and we've been able to do some simulations that show that the transverse field gives similar performance to the uh, radial field. And so it gives us confidence to move forward and kind of doing the right thing. Uh, so let me finish up by showing our team. So I'm leading the team, and working with Manu Jao, Tony Carter, Sitting here in the audience is Anthony Colombo, who's a postdoc working on, on the project. And then we have the kind of collaboration, and I'd like to also acknowledge our funders. Of, uh, the single sensor, two sensor work was funded by internal research, the laboratory directed research and development. And then our current project, we're trying to go to the 36 channel array, is funded by NIH uh, through NIBI. So thank you very much.